even Jacob Rees-Mogg said recently that it would be ridiculous to try and replace Sunak. Uh, I think Sunak, uh, a bit like Major at the very end of his premiership, is, is almost kept going by his weakness because he has so many enemies um, that they can't agree among themselves who should replace him. Hello, I'm John Stevens. I'm the chair of the Federal Trust, and I'm talking once again to Brendan Donnelly, the director of the Federal Trust, about issues related to the UK and Brexit. Brendan, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we discussed the growing turmoil inside the Conservative Party. And since then, we've had the establishment of this new Conservative grouping of Red Wall Conservative MPs. And what now seems likely to be a steady stream of by-elections in Conservative-held seats over the coming months, all of which seem likely to be lost to the government. Why do you think the Conservative Party is now in such a mess? I think it's got two problems, um, one of which is that uh, a lot of MPs are are worried about losing their seats and indeed see little chance of retaining their seats. Um, many of them, I think, have bought into the idea that Boris Johnson had somehow reordered the British electoral map and they were safe for a long career in politics. And they found out that that was a delusion or they're about to find out that that's a delusion. That's a, a very unsettling psychological experience. But more importantly, there's the, the ideological problem. The Conservative Party has nailed its colours so firmly to the mast of Brexit that the manifest failure of Brexit now uh, confronts them with existential choices. Um, are they going to abandon Brexit, which is very, very difficult, given the way in which Brexit has in, in, inserted itself in every nook and cranny of the Conservative consciousness? Or are they going to have a row about what kind of Brexit they need? Do they need a nativist Brexit or do they need a Singapore on Thames Brexit? Um, neither of those is a particularly attractive prospect, but they're the only two um, options which probably the Conservative Party at the moment has op open to itself. And, and hence the, the extraordinary turmoil within the Conservative Party exacerbated by the personal um, meddling of, of Boris Johnson and his supporters. You mentioned this string of by-elections, which look as though it's going to proceed into the into the autumn. And some of these are obviously due to um, the individual problems of particular MPs, but there also seems to be some method behind it in terms of allies of Johnson timing uh, their departures. I'm thinking particularly of Nadine Doris, but there may well be others. Uh, do you think this is a, a plot against Sunak? Is Sunak's position in, in some danger? Could we have a repeat of what we saw last autumn? I'd be very surprised if uh, Sunak doesn't last until the next general election. Um, I think there's a plot against him uh, in order to make things uh, as difficult as possible for him. But I, I don't think that there's necessarily any strategic goal um, to the pinpricks, the substantial pinpricks to which his uh, opponents uh, are exposing him. Um, Sunak, uh, uh, of course, is, is not an obvious leader of the Conservative Party in, in many ways. Um, but at the moment, I think, particularly after the calamity of trust, uh, they've got nobody um, who has any better chance of bringing them together. E even Jacob Rees-Mogg said recently that it would be ridiculous to try and replace Sunak. Uh, I think Sunak, uh, a bit like Major at the very end of his premiership, is, is almost kept going by his weakness because he has so many enemies um, that they can't agree among themselves who should replace him. Well, Rees-Mogg's sense, sense of the ridiculous is obviously a very uh, movable feast. But what about the the issues that lie behind this dispute, the the fuel of, of what is part of this ideological debate inside the Conservative Party? I mean, it seems to me one is is levelling up and the other is, is immigration and the rising level of immigration. Do you think this is a significant issue for the European debate, in particular in the light of the fact that a large portion of this rise in legal immigration is now, because of Brexit, coming from outside the EU. Well, the levelling up agenda I, I never took seriously. Um, I found Boris Johnson and the people around him particularly implausible advocates of a restructuring of the British economy in favour of the least well-off. This was simply a rhetorical trope, um, which um, somehow um, Johnson stumbled upon. One of the problems that the Conservative Party has got, of course, is that Johnson is a, a powerful factor for disturbance, but not in any systematic way. He doesn't have any ideological background. He'll float with whatever 
um, current, he thinks, may bring him back into political power. I, I'm sure that's his long term goal. Um, I'm not sure he has a, an immediate strategy to bring it about. He just wants to hope um, that events will turn in his direction. Uh, as far as immigration is concerned, it, it, it is a, a very interesting fault line between the um, the uh, Singapore on Thames globalist um, Brexiters um, and the nativist Brexiters. Uh, at the moment, it seems to me that the nativist Brexiters, the people who want to stress um, national identity, uh, barriers against foreigners, uh, re-establishment of, of British preeminence, uh, they seem to have the upper hand in the Conservative Party. Um, and that's why we're seeing these um, uh, traditional conservative groups um, springing up or avowedly traditional conservative groups. Uh, a globalist analysis, of course, um, recognizes to its credit um, that if the United Kingdom is to be the scientific and AI superpower um, that some of the Brexiters would like it to be, it, it will need skilled and um, uh, immigration. And, and that's, there's no way around that. So that's an interesting and definite dividing line between the two wings of the of the Brexit party. Um, how it's going to play out, I, I, I don't really know. It, it depends, I think, um, what happens in the next under the next government. Um, I think that the Conservative Party, until it loses the next election, will be condemned to to incoherence. It will simply fight itself to to inaction. Uh, after the general election, it might well take a, a more nativist turn. And it would be at that stage that the question of, of migration would be would be a, a very very significant one. Uh, it would also depend, I think, um, how events develop uh, on the attitude and reaction of the Labour Party. Will the Labour Party attempt to acquiesce or echo in, in a muted form um, this um, move of the Conservative Party in a more nativist fashion, or will it try and take it head on? Um, that, I think, will be important um, for the fate of the Labour government between 19, uh, 2024 and 2029. Uh, have you been, as you've indicated, the uh, in the traditional sort of left-right uh, division of politics, uh, immigration is, a, is, is a, an issue of the right, and levelling up, of course, is, is an issue of the left. How do you see the, the, the Labour Party addressing these in, in office? I think the levelling up agenda will be will be rather easier for them, although uh, the economic difficulties with which the Labour Party will be confronted will, will act as a, a check, um, I think, on, on their desire to to engage in significant redistribution. And the Labour Party, this Labour Party, Starmer and his colleagues, um, don't want to be seen as being economically or financially feckless. Um, they want to be seen as responsible stewards of the public finances. So I don't think they'll go too far down the road of, of radical redistribution. They may well follow the the example of Tony Blair, or perhaps more precisely Gordon Brown, um, of stealth taxes. Um, of engaging in redistribution without wanting necessarily to take the credit for it. Uh, as far as Im immigration is concerned, uh, I, I think that the, the Labour Party do have uh, a certain amount of uh, a room for manoeuvre. Uh, the claims of some on the, the wilder fringes of the Conservative right, um, that by preventing um, Europeans in particular uh, from uh, serving and helping um, the National Health Service in care homes, um, the idea that that's going to provoke uh, a large upsurge of British people who want to work in care homes for high wages, uh, that's obviously fantasy. And, and I don't think it's anything that will commend itself to the increasing number of people who themselves either need care or have relatives, close friends um, who do need this care. Um, so I, I think that they could, the, the Labour Party could afford to take quite a robust attitude um, on that issue. Whether they'll do it or not, I, I'm not sure. I'm very impressed by what I see as being the growing caution of Sama, um, the fear that he will be uh, upstaged and outflanked um, by, uh, by the Conservative Party and its um, supporters in the courtier media. How would these two issues of, of levelling up and, and immigration um, impact on the Labour Party's attitudes towards the European Union in office? I mean, would it draw them closer to the European Union? Would it make uh, that debate easier? Uh, it could. Potentially it could. Um, but once again, I go back to the caution of Starmer. 
uh, I, I think that that if it does um, work out, which it might well do, uh, that European migration, particularly in order to help the NHS, um, is increased under a Labour government, um, that Samuel would want to be protecting himself against accusations uh, that he's reversing Brexit. Um, I think that uh, if the Conservative Party moves, which I'm afraid I think it will, um, in a more nativist Brexiter manner um, in opposition, um, I don't think that um, Starmer will necessarily take this on as robustly as, as I would like, or perhaps many of his supporters would like. Uh, I think he'll perform the, the operation of triangulation, which Blair was so, so famous for. Um, he will want to be able to say um, that he is protecting the interests of the native British population um, better than the Conservatives and, and not really dig too deep at the, the underlying philosophical incoherence of what the Conservatives are advocating. The economic position uh, of the country is so serious now that uh, the room for manoeuvre by a Labour government is financially going to be extremely constrained. And this must open up the risk that they fail to uh, satisfy the expectations which are vested in them, um, either on levelling up or in dealing with immigration or in, in restoring growth. And we have a situation now in which, uh, on long-term projections, any level of growth much above 1% is going to be structurally inflationary. And that is an extremely um, dire prospect. And comparisons made with the 60s and 70s are, I think, apt, increasingly apt. Um, but of course, then we didn't have, um, we, we don't have now what we had then, which was the North Sea oil to address the, the issue at a tactical level and our desire to be part of the European project to address it strategically. I, mean, I don't think it's just economic. I think it's political as well, the problem that he, he's going to have. Um, because... Uh, he's told us, Katama has told us, um, that he's hoping to have a, a much better relationship with the European Union um, as a result of what he calls the renegotiation of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. Well, the European Union are quite clear it's not a renegotiation. It's a, a review and perhaps some slight revision. Um, I, I can well imagine that halfway through um, his period in office, um, he finds himself politically besieged in the way that you've described um, and politically embarrassed because the European Union are, are not going to allow him, as they're not going to allow any British government, uh, to have a, a more sophisticated version of it, having its cake and, and eating it. Um, so I think he is st storing up for himself not many economic problems, which to some extent he can't avoid, but he's also storing up for himself on the European front avoidable problems um, in that he doesn't need to pretend um, that simply being polite to the European Union is going to change the fundamentals of the relationship outside the, outside the European Union for the United Kingdom after Brexit. At the moment, mainstream pro-European opinion in the UK is looking... Uh, it's a, in, with some optimism, I think, towards the prospect of a Labour government. They, and they're looking to a situation in which, OK, Starmer will not be doing anything perhaps uh, very substantial in getting us closer to the European Union in his first term. But he will be uh, guaranteed a second term. And that will be the moment when we will be able to talk about a second referendum to rejoin and things like that. But I mean, if these difficulties, um, which you've described, are as substantial as they seem to be, um, there must be a chance that they don't get a, a, a second term. And that a, is it imaginable that a Conservative Party, even one um, that moves dramatically to the right, becomes much harder um, on uh, English nationalism and on a, a nativist approach, um, could actually still win an election? In a... it's, it's indeed con conceivable. And I think there's a lot of over-optimism um, from the anti-conservative side of the argument uh, about the uh, the certainty, the supposed overwhelming probability of the Labour Party getting getting re-elected. Um, it, it's a powerful argument, it seems to me, in favour of proportional representation, which um, Starmer has set his um, face against. Um, there are those on the conservative side who are precisely afraid of proportional representation because they recognize that there would never be a chance of a, 
an overwhelming conservative majority, as there was in 2019, which could carry out the sort of radical nativist Brexit program that we've been talking about. If he had sense, uh, then I think Starmer would uh, protect himself against the danger of losing in 2029 by introducing proportional representation. If he doesn't do that, then all he can do is hope, hope, um, that the Conservatives will present themselves in the next five years or the five years from 24 to 29 in, in such a rebarbative and such an unattractive light um, that they won't manage to, 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 to scrape any sort of majority together again. Um, it's possible. It's possible. Um, but I think it's a hell of a risk he'd be taking. So what should pro-Europeans be doing now to highlight this danger? I, I think just talking about the the, the lack of certainty of a, of a second um, uh, term for Starmer is, is a good beginning. Um, and I think people are beginning to, to notice, as you see in the opinion polls, um, that there's a difference between uh, hostility towards the Conservatives, which is, which is enormous, um, and enthusiasm for the Labour Party, which is much more muted and may well mute itself even further when they're in government and are taking difficult decisions. I, I also think that in his own interest, um, Starmer would be able to soften his anti-Brexit rhetoric um, without suffering any particular political penalty. He doesn't have to say, we are going to join the, rejoin the European Union, we are going to rejoin the single market, we are going to rejoin the customs union. Um, but he doesn't need to be nailing his feet ever firmer to the plank of saying, we're never going to rejoin, we're never going to rejoin the single the single market, we're never going to rejoin the, single, the, current, the current, uh, customs union. That there was a, a, an illuminating um, opinion poll in, I think it was the Daily Express recently, which um, suggested that, that large numbers of the readers of the Daily Express, in fact, do want to join, rejoin the single market. Now, that shouldn't be taken entirely at its face value. Um, obviously, the, the implications for the European Court of Justice for the acceptance of European um, uh, Union sovereignty um, hadn't been spelled out necessarily. Um, but it, it's, it's quite an interesting straw in the wind. And I, I think that um, uh, when we have these opinion polls, which suggest consistently now that majorities of people want to rejoin the European Union, that does reflect a, a genuine shift in public opinion, which isn't yet reflected at the political level. Well, Brendan, many thanks for this. Um, I hope uh, you enjoyed this uh, video, along with um, others that we do. And if, if so, do show your support. Um, it does seem necessary that the dangers of uh, the complacency that there is at the moment in some quarters towards our prospects of rejoining the European Union are addressed. And certainly the Federal Trust wants to play a part in doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.